According to my dad, when my grandpa died, he and my mom decided that I was too young to attend the viewing or the funeral. I was too. My aunt and uncle decided the same for my three-year-old cousin. A few hours after returning from the funeral, my dad walked into the living room to find me talking to an empty chair. I told him I was talking to Pappy and asked how he couldn't see him sitting there. And I then proceeded to describe the exact outfit that he was buried in, down to the tie pattern and pin on his lapel, despite never seeing him in this outfit. Freaked out, my dad called my aunt and explained the incident. She told him that my cousin had just done the exact same thing an hour earlier. I have a couple of stories, but this one always gets me. When I was around seven, my grandmother took care of a baby whose mother was an alcoholic and drug addict. This woman would bring her child, let's call him John, to my grandmother's house and leave him there for months at a time. Needless to say, our family became very attached and thought of him as part of the family. His mother came to get him one night and her drunk boyfriend flips the car. John was in a coma for about three or four days. One night, my older brother wakes up everyone in the house screaming and crying saying that John is dead. Once my parents get him calmed down, he tells them that John came into his room crying, saying that he has to leave but he's scared and wants my brother to come with him. While my parents are trying to convince my brother that it was just a dream, the phone rings and it's my uncle calling from the hospital to inform us that John had died. This happened over 30 years ago, but I still get goosebumps just thinking about it. Sort of the same thing happened to my grandmother. She was washing ditches in the kitchen in an empty house because my grandfather had taken all of their kids to the beach for the afternoon. Suddenly, she hears the voice of her favorite brother across the country shout her name, and she's so surprised that she jumps and twists her ankle. She looks around but can't find him anywhere. My grandfather came home to find her sitting on the couch, icing her swollen ankle, and she tells him what happened. Two hours later, they get a phone call from my brother's wife, saying that he died at the moment she heard his voice. My grandmother was in a care facility suffering from dementia. I used to visit her quite frequently, but after she stopped recognizing me, I stopped going. One morning I was getting ready for work and this overwhelming and completely random feeling of love from my grandmother just hit me completely out of the blue. 20 minutes later the phone rings and it's my dad informing me that my grandmother had just passed away. I still don't really believe in any of this life after death stuff, but what happened did happen. Something kind of like that happened to me too. My aunt was an alcoholic, had two younger boys and was in and out of jail. After suffering most of her adult life with depression and a whole other basket of mental and emotional issues, she finally remarried and was seemingly happier. One night while I was at work, I was closing the theater and all of a sudden got really, really depressed and I started crying for no reason. I couldn't explain it. That night, I went back to my apartment and cried myself to sleep. I woke up to my dad knocking on my front door. Very strange. He told me that my aunt had unalived herself. The night before she died, she asked her husband if he would hold her one last time and cried herself to sleep. He had no idea of most of her issues and didn't think anything of it. He felt terrible afterwards.
Okay, so this reminded me of a story. I was at sea on a container ship. I was miserable. Things had been going very badly with the crew. I was missing my family. And I was regretting my career for taking me away from home for so long. I had broken up with my girlfriend because I knew she was going to cheat on me, etc. It's a long story. Anyway, I'm laying in my bed one morning half asleep. And I had this dream where I saw my grandfather, who had been dead a few years at his summer place. He was walking with big strides and he looked radiantly happy. He didn't have the limp that he got when he broke his leg at age 70. He was smiling at me and he gave me the feeling that he was proud of me and that I should keep at it. And I was sitting on a beach chair next to his wife, my grandmother, who had been in a nursing home when I left. It was the most vivid image of him and we'd been so close when he was alive. The dream meant a lot to me and really changed my outlook. I even got up to write down my thoughts. When I got home, my dad picked me up on the dock and he handed me the program from my grandmother's funeral. She died at right around the same moment that I'd had the dream. She and my grandfather were together again. And that's why he was so happy. A similar thing happened to my dad. My grandma, his mother, was in a nursing home with declining health. He was working in his office at home and suddenly felt a wave of complete love and joy wash over him for no reason. After this episode, he gets a call saying grandma has died. He called me soon after to tell me that grandma had passed and what he felt before he got the call. My dad is a bit of a spiritual man, but puts rationality before anything so hearing him say this makes me believe him. We all like to think that Grandma's happy somewhere with Grandpa, who died a few years before, and she wanted us to know that. I'm not entirely sure what happens to us when we die either, but I like to think that if there is something, it's a wonderful feeling as my dad felt. Perhaps your grandmother was telling you the same thing. I have a similar story. My mom and dad have the same dream when something bad is about to happen. It's not exactly the same right down to every detail, but the general story of the dream is the same. It's only happened three times in the 20 years that they've been together, but here's one of the stories. My mom and dad both dreamed that I was going to be hurt slash killed in some way. I was only three at the time. Well, in my mom's dream, her mother, who was deceased at the time, came to her saying that she just wanted to hold me. I've never met my grandma. She was killed by a drunk driver before I was born. Well, she proceeded to tell my mother that she just wanted to meet me and told her don't be mad. In my dad's dream, he just felt like he lost something, something very important and it ruined his life. He was helpless. Well, they both woke up and freaked the heck out but proceeded to go about their day as usual. My dad went to the grocery store, came back and parked his truck. He had an F-250 at the time. My older sister, who was five at the time, was strapped in the front seat of the truck and couldn't get out, so she was screaming and crying, just throwing a fit. My dad went and took the groceries in the house. I went outside to the truck. I tried to get in it, and I fell beneath the tire. I, being three and all, also threw a fit and just stayed there crying. My sister proceeded to throw a tantrum and ended up kicking the thing into neutral somehow and the truck rolled over my head and stopped on my chest. My dad came out, saw me, freaked out, couldn't find the keys, they were in a grocery bag, and screamed and yelled for any neighbors to help. They tried to lift it off of me but it was too heavy, so they had to push it over the rest of my body. I had to be flown to the hospital. In the helicopter, my heart stopped for about a minute. The only damage done was scarring and a broken collarbone. Plus my teeth were crushed and I had to get all caps when I was little. 
and had braces for like six years. That was the first dream that my parents had like that. The others were when my little sister and brother were born. My little sister's lungs collapsed and my brother was very sick. My mom had another dream years later with her mom, explaining that she'd held us all now and everything is going to be okay. Nothing really terrible has happened since. My grandmother's entire life, she had a recurring nightmare. In this nightmare, she would be walking down a long, dark hallway, turn to the left, open a door, and see something terrible. She'd always wake up before seeing what it was. In her 40s, she, her husband, my dad, and my aunt were on vacation. They booked the hotel at the last minute, so they ended up having to get two rooms with two twin beds on opposite sides of the floor. My dad wakes up at around 3 a.m. and can automatically tell that something's not right. He calls out in the darkness. Dad? No response. He turns on the bedside light. Dad? He says a little louder this time. Still no response. Getting worried, he slides out of bed and shakes his father. He doesn't wake up. My dad ran down the hotel hallway to my grandma's room and started banging on the door. My grandma worriedly opens the door, and my dad shouts, something's wrong with dad. He leads her down the hallway, a long hallway to the last door on the left. My grandmother reaches the door, turns to the left, and sees her husband dead in bed. He had a heart attack, and she never had that dream again. I've had a recurring nightmare since I was about seven. Friends and I are in the woods and boonies. I don't know why. We stumble across a house with an older lady chilling on the porch. She's friendly and tells us she's in the middle of cleaning out her basement. It's a cavern under her house filled with riches and oddities. She says we're welcome to check it out, so we do. It turns out her small cavern is a pyrite, fool's gold so it is dazzlingly impressive, but ultimately worthless. Disappointed to learn of her mistake, our host offers us lemonade before we continue on our way. As we ascend the cellar stairs to collect our refreshments, the distant horizon is aflame with distant mushroom clouds. We all just stop and stare, wide-eyed. That's when I wake up. At least if this is the same deal, I know that I won't die immediately in the impending nuclear holocaust. I have something similar happen to me though, probably not so creepy. I don't have deja vu the way most people seem to describe it. I have dreams about pretty mundane things that years later actually happen. The most interesting one happened when I was 14. I was at my grandmother's when I woke up. But in my dream, I was in a hospital bed being pushed down a hall, through double doors and into a hospital room. There waiting in the room was a pretty red-headed woman that was relieved to see me. I always knew it was going to happen, but wasn't sure when. Fifteen years later, I'm diagnosed with stage 3 cancer. I've had several surgeries, one that goes wrong and accidentally cripples me, and I'm in the hospital because I have serious blood clots. I refuse all pain meds because they make me feel worse than I do. So, I have a clear head when I'm being rolled back from an exam of my legs, when it feels like I'm 14 all over again, and I don't know what's going on. The woman in the room was my wife, and she said that I had the most confused look on my face, that I didn't know where I was and that I didn't recognize her. I told her that she had met my 14-year-old self and that for 15 years I had been waiting for that moment to happen. 
After nine months of chemo, she cheats on me and leaves me. It broke my heart so badly that I wish the cancer would have just unalived me. However, later I'm with my new girlfriend having breakfast, and suddenly, a very confused 22-year-old me steps in, and I feel like everything is going to be alright from then on. She's now my fiancé. The whole deja vu thing has really changed my outlook on life, and my perception of what time really is. This reminds me of a story that was posted on Ask Reddit a couple of months back. A guy, he deleted his account shortly after, told in detail two dreams that he had when he was a kid that he was 100% sure was events that are just yet to happen. One of them had already happened exactly as he had dreamed it, with names and everything correct on people that he had never met. And the one friend he told it all to was there with him and was freaked out as he was. The other one is yet to happen and took place in New York, with some street vendor selling pizzas at a corner. He was upset, and the last guy in the bunch he was there, forced to pay for everyone because he had done something earlier that day. It was a funny story and all, so I started to PM him under another account. I'm more paranoid than a parrot. I switch accounts basically each month. And eventually we had a chance to meet up and take a few brewskis. Before that day, I thought he was kidding, making a story on Reddit and all even though several other people chimed in and said they had similar experiences. I just took it as a bit of fun. But he was so weird. There are no words for it. He retold the story, and it was obvious that he believed it. But it was the way that he reacted to things. He laughed just a bit too early. He swung around and looked at noises that were about to happen. A glass shattered. And sometimes continued conversations without waiting for my answer usually short yes or no answers. Either he was the greatest performer out there and should be paid to do that to other people or something, or something was seriously off with him. I don't want to put any credit to having any sort of ability, but I just don't know. Sort of the same thing happened to my grandmother. She was washing dishes in the kitchen in an empty house because my grandfather had taken all of their kids to the beach for the afternoon. Suddenly, she hears the voice of her favorite brother across the country shout her name, and she's so surprised that she jumps and twists her ankle. She looks around but can't find him anywhere. My grandfather came home to find her sitting on the couch, icing her swollen ankle, and she tells him what happened. Two hours later, they get a phone call from her brother's wife, saying that he died at the moment that she heard his voice. I lived away from home after high school in California. At the time, I didn't have a car, but I rode my bike everywhere. My grandfather had passed away a month earlier, but sometimes I felt like he was around. So I was on my bike, booking it down a sidewalk one day going the opposite direction of traffic. I was getting to an intersection and had the green arrow, when a minivan rolled up in the right turn lane and stopped. She turned her head and saw me, looked me right in the eye, so I figured she was waiting. I didn't slow down. Just as I'm a few feet from the curb going at least 20 miles per hour, she guns it. I'm talking, holy crap, life flashing before my eyes. And my friend, who was on his bike about 50 feet behind me, later said that he thought the exact same thing. There was no way that I was going to avoid a nasty accident. I hit both brakes. Rookie mistake. Because now my wheels are locked and my front tire skids off the curb into the busy street. As it hits, it stops. But the bike is still moving, pitching me forward. I'm literally flying through the air. 
Time has slowed down, and I can see where I'm about to land, in the path of the lady's tires. Suddenly, I felt two hands, one on each shoulder blade, shoving me down. I didn't fall like an arc like you would expect. I was literally slammed into the pavement, knocking the wind out of me. I glance up to see the rear tire of this minivan roll within one inch of my fingers on my right hand, maybe a foot from my head. My arm was in an L shape. The car behind the minivan stops. These ladies jump out and check on me. One of the women said, how did you do that? You were going too fast. I thought for sure that you were dead. I don't remember what I told her, but again, my friend said the exact same thing. One second I was supermanning it towards the minivan. The next I had just stopped, like I'd hit a wall and dropped prematurely. I can't prove it, obviously, but I'm still pretty sure that my grandpa had intervened. A co-worker of mine told me that she was saved from a car accident by her grandmother. Driving along, about to cross an intersection, and something pushes her foot down on the brake suddenly. The car fills with light, and she has a strong impression of her grandmother's presence. The next moment, a truck speeds across through the intersection out of nowhere. If she hadn't stopped as suddenly as she had, she would have been in a serious accident. One week, during my freshman year of college, I started getting really anxious about something really bad happening to some of my friends. I have statuses from this week that stated, if anyone ever hurt one of my friends, nothing would stop me from unaliving them, and other obnoxious posts like that. I kept my friends on a close leash. Let me preface this by saying that I kept my horse at my school's stables and would go up there every night to clean his stall by myself. It was never a big deal. On a Wednesday night, I was up there cleaning my horse's stall around 7 p.m. I started having a panic attack and was in tears because I became so utterly terrified that I would be R-worded and ended up sending a text to one of my friends about it. I ended up not finishing cleaning my horse's stall, and once I could get my legs to move, I ran as fast as I could to my car so that I could drive back to my dorm. The panic attack didn't go away once I got to my dorm. I posted a ridiculous amount of statuses about how anxious I was and how I couldn't sleep because I was so utterly anxious. My last status posted was around 6.30 in the morning, right before the panic attack stopped. Fast forward to that Friday. My friend from high school who was going to school in another state messaged me and told me that she wouldn't be returning to school for the next semester. This took place in December. When I asked her why, she told me after a series of messages that she had been essentially kidnapped and assaulted that previous Wednesday. Her whole ordeal started right around 7 to 7.30, and she was finally released slash got away around 6.30 the next morning. I almost vomited. I have always been extremely empathetic, to the point where it scares me. I usually have small premonitions, thinking about songs minutes before they come on the radio, suddenly remembering a person from school slash work that you haven't seen or talked to for years, and then running into them within hours. The one big one that I had was a little creepy and happened years back. I would often go to a family friend's house after school on a Wednesday to clean her house for a bit of pocket money. She would leave a back door unlocked for me. It was a pretty good neighborhood, heaps of military families. I would generally open up all the doors and windows to air the house as I cleaned, but for some reason I felt uneasy. I'm always one to trust my gut feelings, so I locked the door behind me 
and didn't bother with the windows. Anyway, I start cleaning and then half an hour later I hear these banging sounds coming from the back door. It scared the freak out of me. I creep up the hallway and peek around the corner at the door and there was this dude peering into the house through the small glass window next to the door. He had the most startled face when he saw me. He turned tail and ran pretty quick and I called the police and then the house owner. I later found out that it was her ex-partner coming to talk to her, even though she had a restraining order against him. I never went over again. I was thinking about this thread and remembered another one that I had that was not a dream. I was working as a bank teller and it was a regularly busy day. I looked up and saw this man walk in and I knew that he was a robber. I made a mental note of his appearance and clothes because I knew I would have to describe him to the police. I hurried with my last customer because I wanted him to come to my window because none of the other tellers knew that he was a robber. I called him over and he handed me a note demanding money. I pressed the silent alarm, said the code word and ducked under my desk, just as I had been trained to do if faced with a note passer. He left empty handed and I was able to give a complete description to the police. He did get caught eventually and I testified to the grand jury to help put him away. I was 13. It was the last day of the school year and the last day at my school. Me and my best friend were walking home together as we normally did, but we were walking really slowly because we were going to different schools in September, so we wanted to make the most of it. We made it to his house and we said goodbye. He was going to his dad's house the next day for a week, but we were going to meet up whenever he got back. He went inside his house and I just had this really strong feeling that I should go back and hug him. It was weird because we didn't really hug. I stopped walking, turned around and started walking back to his house, but then decided that I was just being crazy and I'd see him in a week anyway. I just had this really horrible feeling that something bad was going to happen. The next day I was watching the local news and they said that there had been a car accident. I felt sick. It happened in the area that he'd have to travel through to get to his dad's house, but I just wrote it off as a coincidence. The next day I was watching the news again and they said that there had been a fatal car accident. Him, his dad, and his brother had all died. That was 12 years ago and not hugging him has got to be one of my biggest regrets. I drive a friend home back in high school. It was raining really hard, just unbelievably rough. When we arrived at his house, I got out to grab one of his gym bags from the car while he grabbed his iPod from the aux cord. There was this strange moment where it felt like everything just stopped. We looked at each other over the hood of the car and a shiver went down my spine. He just frowned and said something awful has happened. That was my feeling too. He went inside and I drove the rest of the way home. Two hours later, he sent me a police report, freaking out. Two girls from a neighboring high school that we knew through other friends had taken a turn too sharply and spun out because of the rain. Both of them perished on impact. There had been a car behind them, so the time of death was a known fact. My friend glanced at the time in my car when he grabbed his iPod, and the weird moment outside was the time that they died. Still gives me chills to this day.
Okay, so about 10 years ago, I was asked to be in my friend from high school's wedding. I was living in New York City at the time, so I took the train down to my parents' place in Virginia. The next morning, we were going to drive to the state the engagement party was in. That morning, I woke up and didn't want to leave my parents' place. We finally got on the road at around 1 p.m., way later than expected because I was dilly-dallying. The entire ride, I was saying that I felt weird. We didn't get to the hotel until around 1 a.m. My mom went to go check it in and get our key at the front of the hotel. She comes back to the car, and we drive around the area of the hotel that our room was supposed to be in. This was a very nice hotel in a very nice area of town. We get our stuff and walk into the elevators. Then a man comes out of nowhere and starts saying that he loves some store near the hotel. It was weird, but whatever. The elevator opens, and my mom and I walk in, and so does this strange man. We hit our floor, but the man doesn't hit any floor. That's when I noticed that he was holding a gun. I paused. Then I finally said, um, is that a gun? And the guy says, no, it's a keychain. My cousins gave it to me. I noticed this man had gotten on the elevator at the wrong side. We were the ones closest to the floor buttons and emergency stop buttons. The elevator stopped, and we ran out of there and into our room. Then we called down at the front, and as we were trying to explain what just happened, two gunshots were fired, and a car goes tearing out of the hotel. The police were called. A woman and a man were shot. And guess who their cousin was? That man in the elevator. We were so exhausted the next day, we just went back up to Virginia. My friend understood. It was so random. My mother and aunt used to live in Florida together and my aunt used to work at a seafood place by a beach. There was some sort of event going on at the beach, with tents set up everywhere. A band was playing in one of the tents later on that afternoon, and my mother and aunt had planned to go once my aunt got off of her shift at work. It started to get kind of windy, and my mother was hungry, so she decided to go bother my aunt and get some food. Trudging up from the beach, she sat down and ate. Then my aunt got off of her shift and immediately wanted to go down to the beach. My mom, however, got a really bad feeling all of a sudden and asked her to wait for a while. My aunt wasn't having it because my mother tends to be a worrier anyway and started complaining that they were going to miss the band. But my mom feigned a stomach ache and guilted her into staying. Not a few minutes later, they saw people booking it up from the beach past the windows of the diner. A water spout had popped up and made brief landfall managing to take down the tent that my aunt and mom would have been in had they gone down to watch the band. When I was younger, I was just a kid, I had went to my town's county fair. I happened to run into a girl that I had known from a church that I used to go to. I hadn't seen her since swapping churches, and it was nice to see a friend. We decided to ride the Ferris wheel together, one of the ones that have cabins that are covered on the top, but open on the sides. Each of the cabins would hold four people in them. As we were standing in line for the ride, I suddenly felt sick. Not the kind where you're going to puke, but where something just isn't right. It was like a weight pressing down on my chest and it was like something was trying to tell me not to ride the Ferris wheel. I told my friend that I had decided that I would rather walk through the fun house with my last ticket, and that I hoped she had a good time. So that's what I did. About 30 or so minutes later, my family and I left. When we got home, we saw in the news that three girls had fallen out of the top cabin of the Ferris wheel. My heart dropped. I couldn't help but think of my friend. When the news finally said who the girls were, my suspicion was sadly confirmed. My friend was one of the girls who fell out of it. Then I remembered something. 
there were three of them in it, when the cabins hold four. So if I had stayed and gotten on it with my friend, I would have been the fourth one to fall out of it that day. All of the girls ended up being okay in the long run, with the exception that one of them was in critical condition for a while, and I think that she ended up with some mild brain damage. Many people in my life know this story, but what they don't know is that I have always felt bad for not telling my friends about what I felt, and possibly stopping her from experiencing that. My husband, daughter, and I were renting a great condo and everything was going well. Great school, on a lake, five-minute commute from our jobs, three blocks from our daughter's school, and her daycare was a block away. Everything was great. In about late July, I started feeling really uneasy about our condo, like it wasn't safe, which was weird. We never had any trouble and the landlord was amazing, and the super was great. I tried painting and making the place look better. No matter what I did, something was feeling really wrong, like dangerous wrong. In a matter of a few weeks, the anxiety grew to not just me, but my daughter and my husband as well. Our daughter, now 10, started sleeping in our bed as well as all of our pets. It's like the little voice in my head was screaming to run as far and as fast as you can, but we had been really happy there for almost six years at this point and we were trying to save up to buy a house. Luckily, we were able to move out and bought a house and closed on September 28th. I'm a very type A person, and I'm the first one to get unpacked and settled into a new place and make it home. But this time, I didn't have to push to get things unpacked. I blamed the Thanksgiving and Halloween, the move, my friend's wedding, work, etc. On November 30th of 2018, at 829, Anchorage, Alaska, was hit with a 7.1 magnitude earthquake, which was immediately followed by several huge aftershocks of 6.5 plus. My husband has just sent my daughter off to school, and she was about 50 yards from the house. My husband ran out of the house to get her. The pets were going crazy. The only major damage was my daughter's huge and heaved dresser fell over, and we broke some glass. Because I had not yet unpacked, the only real casualty was half of a nice bottle of rum we got as a housewarming gift. A few months later, I run into my old landlord at the grocery store, and we got to talking. She told me that we were really lucky we moved out when we did. Apparently, right after we had moved out, the new neighbor in the building next door snapped and horribly unalived another neighbor's pets and started shooting and a bullet went through the fence and into my daughter's old bedroom. When the earthquake happened, the lady in the neighboring condo in our old building was not home, and during the earthquake, the cooking oils fell on the stovetop, which turned on the burners and ignited her kitchen, which in turn set an old kitchen on fire. Now, at the time, at 829, my family would still be getting ready for school because we lived three minutes from the school by bike this happened, our daughter would have been in the upstairs bathroom getting ready for school and my husband in the shower downstairs. The landlord said that the upstairs bathroom cabinet came off the wall and shattered glass everywhere and decimated the toilet, which then started flowing into the downstairs bathroom from the ceiling. Meanwhile, all the tile on the downstairs bathroom apparently fell off the walls. The sliding glass shower door basically exploded and that bathroom mirror broke as well, filling the entire bathroom with broken glass, tile, and running water, as well as the brick fireplace collapsed, filling the house with brick dust and chimney soot. Apparently, bricks fell off the roof area and into the yard, smashing the fence, where my daughter kept her bicycle for school. So not only would my daughter have gotten potentially hit by a stray bullet, and my pets possibly murdered, but she would have been seriously injured in the earthquake, my husband would have probably drowned, trapped in the shower full of 200 pounds of broken tile and glass, with the apartment starting to fill with smoke from the neighbor's kitchen fire. 
I really don't think that they would have both made it out. And even if my daughter tried to ride her bike to the neighbors, she could have been hit with falling brick from the roof from the aftershocks. I have never told this to them because I think it would scare them both really badly. But this is not the first time the voice in my head has been right. It's just really scary when it is. My friend told me and some other friends to move our stuff off of his gaming table because he was going to do some cleaning in the gaming basement. It looked nearly clean already. The way he said it didn't set well with me. I questioned him on it, but he dismissed it. He even forgot to do the cleaning one week. It turned out the cleaning he was doing was to cover up a crime center from when he murdered someone. He forgot to do it the week before because in his words that I remember, I didn't do cleaning. Someone was supposed to come over, but didn't. Turns out, that someone was the person that he was going to murder. I once almost got sold to the cartel. I was 17 and extremely naive. I was new to the area and had no idea that it was a heavy cartel area. I was hanging out with a female cousin of mine who had some sketchy friends that I had no idea were sketchy because I was so naive. We all were smoking some bud and I started puking uncontrollably. She was okay, so I didn't think much of it until she went to take me home. Her friend walked us down the apartment steps and then started talking to a group of people. Okay, whatever until I had the gut feeling to run for my life. Like, run and never look back. We were only a few blocks from her house. I magically became sober and book it for her house and tell her to as well. I told her I didn't know why, but I had the feeling to run. Fast forward about a month later, her friend straight up told her that he was trying to sell me to them. Not her, just me. I haven't spoken to her since because she remained friends with him. I was 12. I had a corner store two streets away from my house. So at 7 p.m. I went to go buy a Mountain Dew. This was Canada in the winter, so it was pitch black. I went and bought it without a problem. The clerk working the cash register actually seemed concerned. He kept asking me if I was okay, so that was probably foreshadowing. I left, and then when I was about to get on the same avenue as my house, I passed by one house, and a guy was taking out his garbage. He looked incredibly French. I'd say he's Napoleon Bonaparte, but 33. And he froze and started staring at me walking by his house. And by now, I had the worst gut feeling about this guy. The way he froze and all terrified me. So I turned the corner to go get on the same avenue as my house. I saw the guy's silhouette standing on the sidewalk. Then I walked further, saw his silhouette on the same avenue. So I called my mom and told her that this guy was suspicious. She said to keep an eye on him. Then I saw him start to walk towards me. I told my mom that he was following me. And then I probably got the world's worst shivers down my spine. All my mom had said was run. So I ran. I felt like I was faster than Usain Bolt. And then after running for about 10 seconds, I turned around. And the guy was gone. He probably realized that I saw him and ran off. Might have thought I was calling the cops. I made it home after running for about an extra 15 seconds and I burst through the door, and I mean burst, just panting like all heck and rushing to lock the door. My family was there and my stepdad was confused, but my mom told him about the call. I ran upstairs and made sure to enjoy that Mountain Dew while I played video games. I may have risked getting kidnapped for it, after all.
One evening, me and my parents were going out to eat for dinner, but had noticed that our gas tank was low after a day of driving around the city. My parents couldn't decide on what to do first, eat or pass by the gas station to refill before heading over. For contact, this gas station and Panda Express were a couple of blocks away from each other. I had suddenly gotten really shaken and scared about going to the gas station and asked if we could go eat. I expressed that I was hungry, but also that I had the weirdest feeling in the pit of my stomach telling me not to go. They agreed to eat first, and after dinner, we had found out that a stabbing took place around the same time that we would have arrived if we had went to the gas station instead. I work at a small credit union, and we have limits for how much we keep in our drawers up front. Anything over the limit needs to be put in the vault. We also have a limit for how much we can have in our drawer at the end of the day. Excess gets sold to the vault. One day, a teller left early for the day and sold me her excess cash because the vault teller wasn't available. It was around $7,000, and I'm putting it in my drawer so I can post the adjustment for her selling the cash to me. When I see this man walk in, and something feels off, gut feeling tells me that something bad is going to happen. I greet the man, and he walks up to my window and then stops, puts a finger like just a moment please, and walks back out of the door. I look at the other teller on the line with me, and we both thought that it was weird. I decide not to wait, and put my excess cash in the vault. I walk to the back, and was counting the cash that I was putting away, when I hear this clattering noise from the teller line and I go back out and see the man walking out of the billing and I ask the teller if he's okay and he tells me that the man had just robbed him. The man passed him a note telling him to give him all the cash that he had. The clattering noise was the teller pushing his rolled coin through the window. If he had come to my window, he would have gotten over $7,000. But because he left and I had that gut feeling, he robbed the other teller and only ended up with around 300. To this day, I feel terrible for leaving that teller alone. I didn't do anything against policy by stepping away, but knowing that he had to handle that alone caused me a lot of feelings of guilt. Mine was a couple of years ago, on the way back home from a school trip to the water skiing lake, about a half an hour from our school. Me and my friends were about 18 years old at the time, and had to drive to the lake on our own. There was no bus or anything organized by our school, so me and a few friends drove together in a car. I was not the driver at the time. On our journey back to the school, an ambulance crossed our way and drove past us in the direction that we were coming from. This was not too uncommon, because this was on the main route from our local hospital to the next bigger hospital in the next city. This situation in general was not special at all. Me and my friends joked a bit about the ambulance driver, who looked kind of bored while driving with flashing blue lights. He probably has no patient in the back. He just wants to get home quick. That's why his blue lights and siren were on, we joked. A few seconds behind him was an emergency doctor's car following the ambulance which sometimes happens in Germany, but isn't too common. I don't know why, but in this moment, I just thought that my dad was in the ambulance and that he had a bad car accident. I really don't know why this thought crossed my mind, but there was no reason to think that, especially with the specific thought that it might be my dad. I just had that gut feeling, which I really didn't like. A few minutes later, when we arrived to the next small village where my cell phone had reception again, I saw that I had a missed call from my mom. I rarely get calls from my mom, so my feeling about my dad being in the ambulance just a few minutes prior intensified. Because I was still in the car with my friends, I decided to wait until I was back at the school and out of the car to call her back. When I called her back, my gut feeling was mostly right. My mother called because of me because there was something wrong with my dad. 
that he was on the way to the hospital in the bigger city, and that he mostly was fine. I shouldn't worry. She told me that I should go to my grandparents so that they can drive me to the local hospital so that I can drive my dad's car back home. I didn't worry too much because she sounded calm and said that he was fine. She told me that in the evening I should come to the hospital in the next city and take her home. At my grandparents, I learned that my dad had had a heart attack and had to be rushed to the hospital in the next city. Luckily, he survived the heart attack with no major consequential damage, but that was a shock. In the following days, I found out that the ambulance crossing our way that day was indeed transporting my dad, who was fighting for his life in that ambulance. He's still alive and well today, after having two more heart attacks since then. But every now and then I have to think about that day, and to this day, I still don't know why this thought about him being in there crossed my mind. It still gives me goosebumps. Me and my best friend were hanging out at my rural ranch. No cars in the driveway. I'm 21 and he's 18. He's outside the back of the house pretending he's a blacksmith with our crappy homemade charcoal furnace when a truck rolls up into our driveway. At that moment, I knew that something was very wrong just from the sound of the vehicle. We got so few visitors that I can identify who is approaching by the sound of their car. It's three dudes in a quad cab truck. My buddy approaches the truck, blacksmith hammer in hand. An important fact about my buddy is that he looks like he's 13 years old. At this point, I grab my rifle. Who the heck are they? The driver gets out, and he has a semi-automatic in his holster on his hip. I sight in on him between the curtains and window shutters. They claim to be local ranchers selling their meat door to door. If they were local ranchers, they'd know that you don't just ignore a no trespassing sign like the one on our gate. They ask my buddy if his parents are home, to which my buddy, thinking quickly, said yes, his father is home, and his uncle might want some fresh steaks. He pulled out his phone and called the cops, to which the men quickly got in the truck and left. I knew none of this. I was just watching the body language of the situation going down through the sights of a rifle, ready for them to try something. I'm pretty sure that they were there to rob us.